think it's a it's a question of um, rhythm and timing. I think um, for me, a blog is very much entrenched in in a sense of, of of now. You know, I write a post this week, and it's not the same post that I would write, you know, a year ago or a year from now. From now, whereas when you write a book, it has to have a certain timelessness to it, and it has to be valid and, and lovely to read, whether you read it now or a year from now or, or a year ago. And then when it comes to format, um, a book is so much more lovable than, than a blog can be. And there's something, to me, um, a lot more sentimental about an actual object that you can um, get into your home. And when it comes to my latest, <laughs> Edible French, it's, um, it's very much an object that, that that feels very different in book form because of the illustrations that my friend Melina Josserand uh, made for the book and, um, and the, the, the quality of the paper and the quality of the printing um, can, be, can be equated online. I think that I agree with Clotilde. I'd also say that uh, I mean, Clotilde is the, the, the grand master of blogging because she's been doing it much longer than I have um, and her blog was quite beautiful. Um, one of the ways in which I'd answer the question is that um, I read several newspapers every morning when I turn on the computer, and then when I happen to be in the respective cities where they're actually available on paper, I buy them when I'm going into the underground or the subway or wherever it is. And I never cease to be astonished by how different the experience of reading paper and on a screen actually is. Um, it's a completely different set of perceptions. I've actually gone and read the New York Times, for example, on a screen, and then bought it on paper. Um, and I find myself thinking, how did I not read that? I mean, there are huge lapses and holes, I and mean, it's like a, a very lacy read when it's on a screen. Whereas somehow or another, and I don't know why, I mean, we'd have to ask Marshall McLuhan, but I think that paper summons a very, uh, uh, paper still summons a gravitas, um, there's an invitation to a meditation to take your time. There's not the impatience that we feel subliminally when we're in front of a screen. Um, it's a more deeper and meditative read when it's in print on paper, I think, than when it's uh, anything, anything computerized. Um, and I think there's also the other thing that since I just moved my blog from one word processing platform to another one, the new word processing platform is a scold. Um, it's constantly prompting me with SEO, which means search engine optimization. And in other words, it's trying to get me to stop writing the way that I enjoy writing. And it's been a very interesting experience because on the one hand, um, I'm learning a lot from it, but on the other hand, I don't want to, there's an equilibrium between the type of writing that I enjoy doing and putting into the world um, and what the cyber scold is telling me is correct in the format of actually being on a blog. I agree with that. It's true that the attention span of the, the average internet user is shorter and shorter by the day. And I guess you and I are both kind of resistant <laughs> against that, that trend. I have trouble, um, and I don't even really try, but when I talk about a recipe, and I have a story to tell about the recipe. I don't want to go on and on and on about a recipe, but usually there's a number of things that I think are interesting and, and valuable to share. And I know that most readers won't read, you know, the five paragraphs that I put out. A lot of them will just scroll through to the final picture and maybe the recipe. But I find that, you know, this is still what I want to put out there. And I hope that, you know, some readers find it, <laughs> find it interesting enough to read through the whole thing. But it's true that attention span is, is, is a, huge, um, a huge question online. Um, yeah, so, so my latest, this is not um, a cookbook, actually. There's a few recipes in there, but my last cookbook, the French Market Cookbook, explores um, vegetarian French cuisine. So I wanted to, because I've been eating more and more, more and more plant-based diet for the past few years. I wanted to give people um, a new source of inspiration that would be French, because most people don't really think of French cuisine as vegetarian friendly. But in truth, there's a lot of um, inspiration to be found in regional cuisines, and more and more um, uh, chefs of, the, of of a younger generation are very um, 
attached to um, to the plant realm and the kind of vegetables that they use and and who grows them and how they use them and and you can now you know be served a course that's just just vegetables and the chef doesn't even think of that course as being vegetarian it's just that he had those splendid white carrots that he really wanted to highlight so I feel like this trend plus the kind of Angloization of the Paris food scene has done wonders um, for vegetarians or people who just don't necessarily want to eat meat and fish at, at every meal. And um, vegetables are treated as more than just an afterthought. And certainly there's more and more restaurants um, either wholly vegetarian or, or truly vegetarian friendly. Um, and even for those that aren't, there usually is a way to kind of navigate the, the menu. And for the nicer restaurants, it's always a good idea to call ahead and say, you know, I will, I will be eating at, at your restaurant on that day and I don't eat this or that and can you accommodate me? And they usually will because a good chef likes a good challenge. Um, so I feel like um, in the past few years, it, it has gotten easier and also vegetarians aren't seen as, you know, sad, um, <laughs> sad dieters. Um, you know, people understand, understand that stance a lot, a lot better now. Well, I have very long antenna, um, but, but before, before I answer that, I just wanted to, to add to what Clotel was saying about vegetarianism, um, because I think that we're, it's one of the most interesting things at the beginning of the new century in Paris, um, is that we're sort of on a cusp where people are opening up the back of the clock of what gastronomic pleasure should be and trying to find new ways of creating gastronomic pleasure without resorting to the traditional luxury foods like foie gras or lobster or a lot of these things. I mean, I went last night to the, the reboot at Alain Ducasse restaurant um, and it was shocking in a way because the meal really starts out it was sort of like being in a, a monastery or a factory i mean there's you know little uh galette of seeds and a health cocktail served at the same time as the champagne and everything else the food was very good but it, it i'm still thinking about it and tomorrow I'm, I'm leaving very early tomorrow morning to go do a book tour in california um i think i'll be thinking about that meal for a long time to come and i agree with go to it i think that we're we're at a very interesting and important place um, of trying to, uh, I mean, gastronomic pleasure is uh, personal, but it's also cultural. And I think we're arriving at a place for ever so many reasons through the vectors of health, environmentalism, and gastronomy that we need that we need to, to think much more deeply about what we eat. And, um, and that's what I would also say, by the way, that Clotel's cookbook is brilliant. And for anybody who hasn't seen it, um, she very nicely sent me a copy, and, and there are many recipes that have become regular at home. Okay. <laughs> so for the restaurants? Are you... Oh, for the restaurants. Um, <laughs> I thought maybe I could kind of... <laughs> Grant has a long shepherd's cook. Um, I read, oh, I read, the most obvious way of knowing what's going on in Paris is to read the French press, and, and um, I follow lots of different people. I follow print press, I follow... Um, other blogs, I, I'm on lots of PR people's lists, um, and every once in a while there's just good luck, you know, I mean friends, um, I have friends all over Paris, I live in the 9th arrondissement, um, because I like to eat, I'm spending most of my time in eastern Paris now, which is where most of my friends live, and uh, people are constantly sending me emails, I mean I get lots of tips both through my blog and through friends saying this is a terrific new restaurant that's open that you should think about. Um, I'm much more, I'm much more receptive to that type of tip than I am to anything that comes over my transom from public relations people. And that's not to offend anyone who works in public relations, but um, it's more exciting to think that something might be undiscovered, as unlikely as that is in the age of the internet. It's a lot of well, when a, when a post is first published, it's um, it's a lot of wow that looks good, <laughs> which is always pleasant. But what I like best is um, first of all, I usually finish my conclude my post on on a kind of an open question to open the discussion to more than just this particular recipe because 
it may be a recipe that I devised because I had too many greens to use up, and so I kind of opened the floor um, for ideas of how to use an excess of, of, of greens. And so I get a lot of inspiration and ideas from that. And, and then um, a little while after the post is published, I love getting feedback, even years and years after the fact, um, from people who have actually tried the recipe and report back on it. So um, fortunately, it's most of the time people who really enjoyed it. Every once in a while, it's someone who had a big failure. And so I make it a point to really try to understand what, what happened and try to help this person out. Half the time, it's people who said, you know, I followed the letter to a tea, but I substituted rice flour for the wheat flour, and I removed the sugar because we don't eat sugar at home. And I'm like, well, yeah, you know, it might be a nice rice galette, but... <laughs> um, but sometimes it's just a matter of, of technique that um, I realize could be explained better, and so it helps me grow as a recipe writer also. And I really enjoy this, um, this back and forth discussion because... Um, this is truly the reason why I started the blog in the first place and what has been most gratifying to me over the years is the fact that through my writing and through these recipes I, I, I touch people's lives and I enter their home in, you know, tiptoeing through their stove and it's just very heartwarming to me to think, you know, I, I created this recipe in my kitchen for the people I love and someone, you know, on the other side of the planet has adopted it into their own repertoire and it's always... Um, you know, I love hearing about the yogurt cake, for instance, which is a huge, um, you know, it's a, it's a French classic, but it's one that, ha that is so versatile and so easy to make that it has been adopted by, through my blog, by, by lots of readers, and um, I keep hearing about it, and it's been, you know, I've had the blog for 11 years now, and, and it's always a pleasure to hear about that. Um, well, since Paris is home, I have a very, you know, I've lived here for almost 30 years, and I've lived in different, different, I've had many different lives in Paris, in different neighborhoods, um, and different circumstances, and um, what I, I mean, it's 109 restaurants, um, my thinking is because I travel a great deal too, if I find myself in Frog, as I did a couple weeks ago, um, I look, I'm as much a consumer of this information as I am a producer of it, and I often find myself thinking, thumbing through books and thinking, but which ones are really good? Um, I still believe that the subjectivity of, of criticism is a useful thing in the age of the internet. This is something food criticism, uh, in general, has been, um, you know, people have been marching through the street with torches and saying, my opinion is as good as anyone else's, we don't need this anymore. I don't really think that's entirely true. I think that um, my my way of putting the restaurant in, uh, out there is to put it in context. And as a traveler, there are times when I want a simple meal, or I want a quiet place, or I'm willing to be extravagant, or I, it's a certain season and there's something I'd like to eat. Um, I love the regional cooking in France, and that's another reason why I like Clotilde's vegetarian cookbook so much, because of the, the regional recipes. I mean, the French kitchen is still uh, it still exists on the bedrock of its regional kitchens. And so um, when I try to winnow things down to 109 restaurants, they all had to be really good, but they also had to have some kind of geographic distribution mm -hmm. and uh, respond to different emotional or sociological contexts. So first of all, I've always been I, I grew up in a family that um, where English was spoken. It was actually used by my parents as a secret language, um, so us kids wouldn't understand what they were when they were discussing Christmas and stuff. You got so really, it, it was a very good revenge. Uh, <laughs> yes. You cracked that code. <laughs> yeah, but it certainly gave us, you know, the the uh, motivation to uh, understand and speak the language. And um, I've always been very curious about language and what it tells us about a culture, a people, a place. And so in learning English, I've always been very interested in the differences between the two languages, how, the, how they're built and, um, and what they say about, uh, about us. And it's really the, the exact same reasons why I'm interested in food. Um, because food tells us a lot about um, the people who eat that food or won't eat that food. And, um, and because I keep the blog in, in both uh, French and English, I am constantly um, 
translating my own words actually from English to French because I usually write my posts in English first and then uh, translate them into French and so I'm constantly um, noticing the differences in, in wording, the way that I can um, insert a joke in English that will not work at all in French and, and sometimes as I write in English I think, oh, you know, when I write the French version there's that you know, that pun or that play on words that I need to think of um, inserting. And so I've always been very happy with that ping pong between the two languages. And um, actually six years ago, I was having dinner with Shelly and Jean, who are sitting there at the, on the second row uh, at a restaurant in the 18th. And on the menu, uh, there was, the menu was decorated by, with um, um, French expressions related to food. And um, we had we spent a happy moment um, trying to translate them and trying to understand where they were coming from. And I realized that although I knew the meaning of all of them, I did not know the origin most of the time. And so um, this is what started a series of posts on my blog called Edible Idioms, in which I featured um, a, one post, uh, one expression at a time. And, um, and try to, you know, I did some research to find out what the origin was. Sometimes it was unclear. Um, so there, there were often several, um, several theories about the origin of, of each expression. And so I've been doing that for years, and, and I realized that a lot of my readers are also Francophiles and also French language lovers, and so this resonated well with, with them. And I always had in the back of my mind that it would make a really lovely collection. But I was lacking, um, what was missing from my idea was a visual element because I didn't want to write a scholarly um, encyclopedia of expressions. That wasn't really my intent because I'm not a linguist, so I, I didn't want to write that kind of book. But then a few years ago, um, a French woman living in London contacted me and she said, you know, I'm, I, um, I'm actually an attorney by day. But um, my, my kind of creative outlet is to uh, paint watercolors, and I paint mostly watercolors of food. And would you like me to illustrate a few of those expressions for your blog? And so I said yes. And I was so smitten with her style and her sense of color and the, the, the real playfulness with which she paints those, um, those foods that after a while I said, you know what, we'll stop with the expressions on the blog, we'll, we'll keep your illustrations for, for, for a, a book format. And so I talked to my agent, I talked to my publisher, and we decided that it was a good idea to put it together into a book. So I selected 50 um, expressions that seemed the most representative and also had a pithy explanation to them because every once in a while you, know, you have one that's like, you know, you kind of guess the meaning and there's no real story behind it. And so she painted the, the, the watercolors to go with them, and this is the book that came out of it. And um, I'm really pleased with the production value of it, um, because the, they chose a really lovely paper that actually feels like the, the watercolors were kind of our originals, which, um, which the illustrator is really happy about. Can you give us some examples of some of these? Sure. Um, um, well, for instance, I just opened it to um, uh, N'avoir plus un radis, which means not having a single radish left, and um, and this means not having a, any money left. And um, it is one of the the many expressions that are based on old slang words. And it's really interesting because the slang words, um, the usage of the, the actual slang word disappeared, but the expression remains. Uh, radis used to mean um, um, a cent, um, uh, un centime. Actually, I think it was un sou, which is from the old currency system pre-French -revo pre Revolution, and um, it was called a radis because usually slang is um, plays with sounds a lot, and so un sou uh, was called also un rond, which is actually still used because of the shape, and rond, radis, and usually small vegetables are used for things of, of little value, and so un radis meant, um, meant a coin, but no one says, you know, um, you know, can I can I borrow some radis? You know, so the people don't really use that slang word anymore. Um, but the expression uh, remained, and so it was just really. Um, it's it's been a great exploration for me, and I hope it is for for readers who have the book in their hands as well. Well, I think my UPS man could give you all sorts of really. Uh, if, if he was here to show you a, a photo gallery of what I look like when I answer the door, <laughs> I would probably tell a greater truth than anything I'm likely to share tonight. Um, the thing, I'm, since it's it's, I have an office, I work at home, and the first thing I do every morning is read 
the same six different newspapers between the British press, the American press, and the French press. Um, I look occasionally sometimes at Italian, Spanish, German things. I love to read. I have to stop myself. I have 20 windows open on the computer all day long. <laughs> My deal is that whenever I'm ready to get up and walk away and procrastinate, I can look at a window instead. So, um, but it's, um, what surprises me a lot is how, uh, how can I explain it? I suppose everyone who writes has this experience. Um, for me, I do the writing, I'm constantly sanding away and, and planing it and trying to get it into the right place. And then when I put send, push send, it's done. And I forget sometimes that people actually read these things. And um, when I was in America in March and was sitting in a train on my way up to uh, do a reading in the public library of my hometown, which is Westport, Connecticut, um, I was sitting there completely lost in space when the lady I was sitting next to, or uh, coming back into the city, turned and said, I really liked your story in the Wall Street Journal three weeks ago, and I, my teeth almost fell out. There's such a, it's, it's such a solitary, meditative work, and I think that's why I like it so much. But it's also fun every once in a while to uh, put on a clean shirt and come meet the people who actually <laughs> read these things. <laughs> um, I guess a day in my life is... Um, it's hard to define one because one of the reasons why I really um, enjoy this kind of new career that I've carved for myself is um, is that there's there are no two days uh, alike. Um, there are days that I spend at the computer writing. There are days that I spend in the kitchen uh, testing or developing recipes. There are days that I spend out and about exploring and researching and meeting people to do interviews. Um, or, or clients, and um, or, or taking people on walking tours, and um, but I guess most of most of the time it's a lot of sitting at the computer <laughs> typing, which I'm fine with um, because I feel like with the internet there's really a lot of things that you can you can you can be sitting at the computer and not feel like you're sitting at, at the computer. And like Alec, I, I'm a, an avid reader of. The content that's out there, and um, although I'm, I read more um, online publications than um, than actual print publications that have a, an online existence, I guess um, I have to stop myself also and kind of set a timer for myself because the problem nowadays is not finding good content, is selecting the good content that you decide to consume. Um, I think that the, the fait maison is a symptom of very serious problems in the French food chain and in the French restaurant industry. And um, so my perspective on it is that it's a glass half full, glass half empty situation. Um, the problem is known, it's widely discussed, it's being addressed in a variety of different ways. Fait maison, for anyone who doesn't know, um, know what that means, um, is a new designation that restaurants were authorized to um, publicize or post or put in their menus or in their windows if the food they were serving was actually made on the premises in their own kitchens. It was partly made. Well, that's what happened, unfortunately. Um, and um, at the uh, last minute, the agro-industrial industry punched hundreds of holes in it so that it became effectively worthless. And I would, I, I think, a friend was asking me, a South African friend was asking me about it the other day because he saw it in a window somewhere. And I said, it's a very useful thing because I wouldn't go into a restaurant that, that felt that it was necessary to put that up. So it's kind of, a, you can look at it as a stop sign as much as anything else. But um, I think, however, that for a long time, the um, a trope of the uh, English-speaking world has been to um, say that the food in Paris and France more broadly isn't what it used to be. Um, some people have actually made successful careers to this, based on that premises. Um, as someone who's lived here for such a long time, I've watched the evolution, and I think the food in Paris today is, uh, is actually quite brilliant. I think that the food that seduced me as a, a teenager when I first came here is still available. Things like the bourguignon and poulopo and things like that. 
but there are layers, new layers have been added to the, the, the city's food landscape. Uh, it's more cosmopolitan, the cooking is healthier, um, there's foreign talent in the kitchen, there are more women in the kitchen, um, people are eat, thinking about food differently. Um, I think that Paris is in the midst of a very creative and very uh, deliciously creative period right now. I think we're quite spoiled for choice. And I take it for granted as a Parisian, but then because I travel so regularly, I go to other cities and see what is available in context for the same money. And the quality of the cooking is often nowhere near as good as what we, what we have here. I guess I kind of circumvent the question by saying that I'm not recognized <laughs> by <laughs> chef or staff. I'm, uh, it happens to me that I'm recognized, but usually by other customers <laughs> who uh, read my blog. So, um, so I don't really have that problem per se, but the response that is usually given is that the food critic knows, you know, you can tell if you're given special treatment, you can tell if you get, you know, five times more food and more truffles in your meal <laughs> than the table next to you. And um, although some people choose to go with that and kind of flatter the restaurateur that's um, kind of treating them lavishly, um, I think it shows in their writing that they're kind of in it for, for the special treatment. I guess, at least from, from my readings of, of more um, famous food critics, I feel like I can tell the ones who pay their bill and, and those who get invited. Um, I don't think that, um, first of all, because I've learned my, my uh, metier on Ruth Rachel's knee, um, and she was a very harsh uh, taskmistress, and I, when I was doing the gourmet job, I was told to keep myself at arm's length from all the chefs and all the PR people. After gourmet closed, I had to uh, climb down from this mountain, which was not a place I ever really wanted to be, um, and, and get to know my colleagues, which was, has been wonderful, and I really enjoyed writing for different outlets. Um, but the reflexes of the decade that I worked for Gourmet are very much built into me. I, I don't believe that, as Clotel said, I think sure maybe somebody could go wild with the truffles and I wouldn't stop them. Um, I'm very, I take a very humble approach to my work because I have so much respect for, that, for what goes on in a kitchen. I've worked in kitchens myself. I never thought when I was doing summer jobs in New England, um, including making nearly lethal 50-pound vats of potato salad um, and egg salad. I can't believe that. I probably did. There are probably cemeteries that, I'm, that I filled with. Um, but having, having actually worked in kitchens, I know a lot about the actual physical work of cooking. And I don't think that anybody can suddenly, um, if they saw a famous food critic uh, come in, the products that you have in your fridge is only as good as the products that's there. I mean, you can, you can, if you, and if you're a good cook, you're gonna, you're still gonna be a good cook. Um, of course, there are things that can be done. I mean, you can suddenly discover that somebody, you had an open bottle of pomme roll, um, you know, there are ways of bathing people. Um, but I'm pretty standoffish when it comes to things like that. But but it's true that um, there's this psychological mechanism that when you're given something for free, you kind of feel indebted to the person who has given this to you. And so I do feel that um, re restaurant critics who, who get invited, and oftentimes it's not through their own personal decision, but rather that their publication does not have a budget for them to, for yeah, the resources for them to even pay their bill, let alone go twice or five times, as, as is the case for a publication like the New York Times. And so it's true that it, it, there's a real, you know, they, I'm sorry? Not anymore than you Not anymore, anymore. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but, but I guess it's, um, yeah, it's a matter of personal, of, of personal ethics. And, and I, I guess the service also, you, you mentioned, you know, your food is only as good as what's in your fridge. And the quality of service, you can't, you can't all of a sudden be the perfect waitstaff if if your waitstaff is disorganized and rude. You know, it's 
you can't change that just because someone important walks in the door. My person, well, there, there's two answers to that. First of all, you need to have a good anti-spam system just for the for the robots posting, um, you know, bulk links about about cheap uh, handbags. Um, but then when it comes to trolls and actual real life commenters, my experience, and it's been 11 years, is that you really you um, there's a sense of karma to the internet where I feel like you get reactions that are um, that reflect what you what you put out there and I think that people who get really strong um, strong reaction that may hurt their feeling I think it's usually a good thing to look at what they're writing and the kind of um, the kind of tone that they write in and the kind of expression opinions that they express and if you're a little antagonistic people are going to be antagonistic back at you and I feel like at least for me, I'm more interested in writing about positive things. It's just my personality, I guess. I'm more of a glass half full kind of person, and so I feel like because I put things out there in that in that spirit, um, people react in that respectful spirit also. And I very, very rarely have problems with uh, with commenters being rude or uh, personal attacks or that sort of thing. I feel like. I maintain a measured, kind of respectful um, atmosphere around my post, I guess. What do you think? Merci. <laughs> I, I agree with Clotet. I think, though, that um, in terms of what I do, there are times when I am critical because my perspective on the meal is that the work that I'm doing is for you. Um, I spend a huge amount of my own money every year in restaurants. Um, I have friends coming to Paris from all over the world. Uh, as we're sitting here tonight, there are hundreds of aluminum tubes in the sky with people sitting inside looking for reading food guidebooks, looking forward to their meals. Um, I write for those people because I'm lucky enough to live here, um, but the chance of actually being here and spending your money, um, I don't want anyone to have a bad meal on. I think the criticism is, I'm very careful with criticism, it's never gratuitous, but I think it has a place. and. Um, the most flattering thing that occasionally happens um, is when a chef approaches me and says, you know, thank you very much. I mean, I really appreciated that. It was, I thought a lot about it. I didn't like it when I first read it. I was furious with you. But you pushed me to really reflect on what I'm doing, and it was useful. I love to cook. I am. Uh, that's what I do. I mean, when uh, we were Grant asked us earlier what how what a typical day is, I cook lunch for myself every day. I don't like to go out for lunch because it breaks up the work day. Um, and I love the sort of meditative aspect of being home all day long. But I cook a proper lunch every day. And um, if I'm in restaurants, probably five nights a week, we never go out on the weekend because I, the. Weekend is, from my point of view, just not a great time to go. Restaurants are under a lot of pressure, and it's a different crowd. Um, and because I really powerfully love to cook, and uh, I love to go to the market, I don't, I don't, with all due respect to colleagues who don't cook, um, perhaps you could do this work if you didn't cook, but um, I need to walk through the market and see the steps, and um, be very close to the produce. Uh, it helps, it really informs everything that I do when I go into a restaurant and read a menu. Uh, and it also keeps me very humble because um, I know how it's very easy to go in and order something. And uh, I think there's a broken link there sometimes. I think especially since the highest end of the food chain, very expensive restaurants that Clotel mentioned earlier, um, those restaurants, which are sort of drifting like hot air balloons beyond all of our reach, um, are dangerous places because they're so expensive that if you had a bad meal in one of them, it would be hard, not only heartbreaking, but you, you'd be, you might want to stab someone. Um, so I'm more exigent with those places than anything else. Um, and I also know, however, how much pressure those cooks or actually those chefs are actually under because they are. Um, as one chef said to me the other day, the first thing I find on my desk every morning are, is a printout of all the TripAdvisor comments. Mm -hmm. And um, they are, I mean, the social media is 
profound and very deeply monitored on all the best known restaurants in Paris, and the chefs get feedback constantly. And I, you know, I mean, on that on top of everything else that's involved in running a kitchen, I mean, it, it is my respect for the metier of chef knows no limits. I guess um, I don't really have a single point of entry for uh, information on food, but I use Twitter a lot, um, and I follow, I, I don't know, maybe 300 different accounts, and I, I monitor, you know, what everyone is posting, and, and the variety of my selection ensures that I get, you know, links to stuff that's from France, and from Australia, and from the US, and from all over the world, and that's kind of my way to navigate um, the wealth of content that's out there. Um, I'm very, of course, interested in reading some of the uh, uh, opinions of my colleagues. Um, what other people think of a, of a restaurant or um, of, a, of a chef or a food doesn't influence what, what I, I end up writing, but I'm interested. Um, and I think that one of the things uh, one of the things that drives me crazy is the the colonialism that still exists um, from the English-speaking world toward Paris. Um, when the last Paris issue that Gourmet did, I said when I was in New York and we had a meeting in the big ugly Condé Nast building in Times Square, I said, you know, why are we talking about... Uh, none of us were born in Paris, and none of us are French. Could we? Could I? Could can we get some French voices into this issue? I mean, why are we still putting on pith helmets and going into the jungle like this? I mean, it's patronizing, and it's and it would be more interesting to broaden the scope. Um, so I'm, I, a lot of the people who I read locally are French, and um, like Quotil, though there are other cities that I follow. I follow London. I follow what's going on in California. Um, I'm fascinated, I read the major food websites like Food and Wine, etc., and Bon Appetit. Um, and it's fascinating to see the, uh, looking at America from this distance, I'll find out tomorrow, um, how great the food, I mean, food is, there's good food all over the United States right now. It's not just a, an East Coast, West Coast, Great Lakes thing anymore. So, I read very broadly. It's probably very personal, but when I read through those comments, I usually get from the tone, from the spelling, from the grammar, from the, I don't know, from, um, from the way that the person expresses him or herself, I usually get a sense of whether that person might share some of my taste or not, and I read through them without being too careful about each and every one of them, but I kind of get um, a cloud of impression. and. Because there are so many restaurants out there that you can go to, if I have the merest doubt that maybe it's a place that I won't enjoy or maybe I'll have a problem with the service there because I, I mean, I guess I'm probably even more um, sensitive to the quality of service than I am to the quality of the food when I go out and um, I'll, just, I'll just stay away because I'll think, you know, I don't want to risk my money and my evening on, on a place the people who go there um, dislike. In, in a general way, I think that trip advisors are a bit of a bog. Um, the only time that I've ever, uh, in an unqualified way, used trip advisor was five years ago when um, Bruno, my partner, and two French friends were going to a wedding in Tampa, Florida, and I was supposed to book the hotel. And as I was zipping up the suitcase, I suddenly thought, oh, Jesus. So I turned the computer back on, and I just quickly went and booked two rooms in the first hotel at the top of the list. And when we finally got to Tampa, which was an epic uh, journey, the uh, nice guy at the car rental place, I said, we're staying at the Casa Fiesta, or whatever it's called. Can you, is it near? And he said, see that? That skyscraper sticking out of the mall over there? It's just across the road. What you do is you drive in and you drive under and there's a valet park. I'm still living I'm still living this down. I mean every once in a while with my French friends, if I say, uh, because I also do travel writing and review hotels and other things, uh, 
if I'm going on about a charming hotel in Carlo Vivari in the Czech Republic and I'll say Casa Fiesta, um, and I think, but I think that um, I think that as Cotel said, I think that and it's it's cumbersome. Um, I think that the crowdsourced information is often more useful for. Um, basic services like people raiding an airport shuttle bus or I think occasionally it's useful for hotels but I think that food is when you look at the top 20 restaurants in Paris of a, of a given day there are places I mean I, I do look sometimes just for fun if I'm on hold um, and the, I, it amuses me because everybody knows that those reviews are bugged up you know and we'll give you an after dinner drink if you if you Promise you'll write a review on TripAdvisor. One mm -hmm. of the one of the uh, the major trends this, this autumn is um, many of the best new restaurants in Paris, uh, from my point of view, are have Japanese chefs, as you mentioned, and I'm fascinated by their cooking because what they do is they. They've come here, um, France loves Japan, uh, or Japan loves France more than any other country in gastronomic terms right now. There's a reverence for France in Japan that, that has gone missing in, in European countries and in other places. Um, even in France? Even in France. <laughs> um, and yet there is the, and the, all of the really admirable qualities of the Japanese culture, I mean, they are hugely studious and very careful in learning their lessons. Then they go out and open their own restaurants. There's still something vaguely off-center about the food. I mean, there's still ways that they'll approach the produce, or the technique is so perfect that it's almost angelic. Um, and a lot of, in fact, a lot of the food uh, that's, that I've been eating the, in the new restaurants this fall is this sort of cuisine angelique. Uh, where people don't cook to meld flavors anymore, they compose things in a plate. And it's the idea of percussion or different tastes and textures uh, interacting. But the idea is, is that the individual flavors uh, remain separate. Um, and the actual cooking occurs in your own mouth. And I think that that's, um, I think that that's, uh, a trend, and, but I also think in terms of French per se, I think that the young chefs are a community, an international community. They gather, they interact on the internet, um, they exchange recipes, there are all sorts of associations. I think that the, the, the chef community is more international today than it's ever been before. Um, and it's harder and harder and harder to parse out that nationality in a in terms of actual foods. I think there are techniques, and I think there's certain t taste spectrums that are um, indigenous to certain cultures. Some cultures like smoke and salt more than others. Some cultures like sweet and sour. Uh, but in general, I think that there has been a, a, a waning of the specificity of, of national kitchens among young chefs. I just am um, in complete agreement with you, but I, I did want to note that I feel like even if a French chef is inspired by his travels throughout Asia or in Spain or in South America, because I feel like Argentinian, Peruvian uh, cuisines are kind of on the rise, still they use French ingredients um, and they usually seek out local producers that may produce their um, their, their products in, in an artisanal and traditional ways. So, I feel like it's interesting to see those uh, foreign influences through the lens of someone who was born and raised in France, trained in France using French ingredients. Also, I wanted to note that French cuisine is never 100% French. I mean, depending on the region where you are, you know, in Alsace and Lorraine, it's very um, Germanic. Um, you know, in the in Provence, it's very close to Italian cuisine. In the Basque country, it's very close to Spanish cuisine. So it's always been kind of a melting pot of influences and, and people have always traveled and brought their ingredients and techniques and tastes with them. So I feel like it's maybe just a globalization. I mean, because of the globalization that it's on a more of a high speed, uh, high speed trend. But in truth, it's nothing, it's, it's nothing new. I think the major
major lesson that can be learned from that is that for an inexplicable reason, she received the kind of cease and desist, um, I don't even know what the French term for that is, but she, she received in the mail a letter saying that she, she was in trouble for what she had written. And for an inexplicable reason, she decided to defend herself in court, whereas the guy opposite was represented by a lawyer. And I, what I read from someone who, was a, a, who, who has a blog and who's also a lawyer in, in real life, because oftentimes lawyers and attorneys are very food savvy and, and very interested in food, they certainly have the means to, yeah, exactly, to uh, explore. Um, he said if, if she had been represented by even just an average lawyer, um, he would have known the articles to point out and, and, she, and she would never have lost um, that, um, that, um, that suit. And as a refrain from posting about restaurants that I didn't like um, because I don't have the means to go back to places that I don't like and I usually give, give um, the restaurant the benefit of the doubt. Um, I guess I can I can be subtly I mean I can I can get my point across without writing a scathing review. What about you? Um, I'm willing I think to be more critical but I'm I try to be very careful with the criticism. It would never muzzle me. Um, one of my favorite food critics right now is a woman who writes for The Guardian named Marina Olofsson. Um, I think that uh, she, if you, if you haven't read her food reviews, I highly recommend her on the Guardian website. Um, they're laugh out loud funny, and it's the humor. I mean, that's one thing about American food writing. There's still a big difference between the UK and the US food writing. American food writing is often witheringly serious, and in England they have a lot of fun with it. And um, I think that by introducing a little bit of humor into the criticism, you don't um, blunt the honesty of what you're actually trying to say, but you, you make it more palatable. And I think this review in particular was um, more than a little insulting to one um, white person in particular, which was probably a bit out of line. Um, you know, she didn't get good service or something, and she was pretty insulting in her description of the waitress who gave her bad service. So I'm sure that didn't help. <laughs>